Thank you. I think all of us that are, are speaking to you have the same challenges. There's just so much we'd love to share and talk about. So I'm going to be throwing out lots of different things, and I look forward to discussing with you of those with you. And many thanks to Maha and Lisa and Renee for pulling all of this together. It's just wonderful. Now, I, when I named this challenges of being young and female in, in Iran, I was focusing on the female a lot, but then I began thinking about challenges in a number of respects. You'll note the date at the bottom. Um, it's August 7th today. It's also the 16th of Mordad in 1398 and 6th of Zulhijjah in 1440. So you have the Gregorian calendar, the Iranian calendar, and the Islamic calendar. Iranians have their own calendars, which are quite different, which um, matters, I think, to some extent. So whose millennium? It's not a millennium in Iran. So um, they wouldn't use the word millennials. It wouldn't make any sense. For various purposes, people do refer to Western calendars for business or other things or travel plans, perhaps. But um, when it comes to thinking about their own youth, they most certainly wouldn't categorize them that way. So I think one thing that can be useful when you're comparing different places is to think about the ways in which youth are categorized. Um, not always does this happen, but in Iran, it, they, it most certainly does, especially since the revolution. So I think it's important to think about that temporal framework. Um, Iran has a solar calendar, so it's got 12 months, and uh, they don't slide around like Islamic months that go back um, every year. So it's fixed. You know, you know, the March 21st for us, which is the start of the new year for Iran, is always in the same place. Um, there also, um, the, there was an imperial calendar, just as an aside, which was introduced in 1976. And it um, started in 599 AD. The then Shah wanted very much to um, foreground the pre-Islamic history of Iran and identify with that. And so he instituted an imperial calendar. They, I was working and living in Iran at the time. And they were, there were calendars hung on the walls in the university. Um, everyone is supposed to use these dates. Nobody I knew did. People hated it. And, and it just went out of, out of use. Um, it was discontinued in 1978 formally, but from the time they introduced it, almost no one used it. They just had no use for it. So, but it's it's interesting to see how um, ways of uh, organizing time, thinking about time, represent a lot about uh, an individual history. Now, I wanted you to just a lot of you will know this, but I thought just a quick review of the different periods of more recent history in Iran. From 1921 to 78, there's Pahlavi rule. Reza Khan came in, um, took over as a military leader, but then in 1926 had himself um, coronated as Shah or king, and then his, he was abdicated in 1941 when his son Muhammad Reza Shah took over, and he was there until the end of the revolution. So that Pahlavi reign um, went from uh, 1921 to 78. 1979 is when the um, the Islamic Republic was proclaimed. There was a referendum. There were very nice ballots with red and green on them for yes and no parts that you would put, whether you would agree with having the Islamic Republic or not. And it was an, uh, a landslide victory for the Islamic Republic um, at that point. Now, I was in Iran at that time. And of course, when a revolution is going on, you may not realize it's a revolution that's going to really change things. It's um, civil unrest. It's uh, fighting. It's a, a lot of terrible things are, are happening, but also some very exciting things that people hope will lead to change. So um, then 1979 is now what they call the, the, date of the, they, of the date of the revolution. But really, throughout 1978, there was a lot of revolutionary activity and women were much involved in it um, quite prominently. And also, the Khomeini would talk about how women's rights would be advocated, how women were going to be very important in the Islamic Republic and much respected. Now, uh, very shortly um, after the Islamic Republic was established and things looked a little rocky, it seemed an opportunity, um, at least from an Iranian point of view, for Iraqis to invade. Um, and they wanted to gain territory down in the southwest of Iran. And the war um, lasted a, a very long, very painful eight years. And this is something that's very formative in the um, minds and, um, and persons of a lot of uh, young people now. And you'll see that as we talk about the categorizations of, um, of youth. Then after Khomeini died, um, Ali Akbar Hashemi Rasanjani was elected as president. Um, there was an, an opening of sorts uh, socially and culturally. Um, the US sanctions I put in there just because that's when they, they started and um, they've made a huge difference. And they loom, of course, very large in Iranians' minds. 
Claude Temi was elected in 97, a, a reformist concerned with the dialogue of civilizations, really wanted to reach out to the West. He's German educated, a cleric. He was reelected. Um, a lot of people felt he didn't bring as many changes as they had hoped. And then after him came Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who instituted a much more um, conservative way of uh, approaching many things, including um, women's movements through public space. At one point, he even advocated in buildings having separate elevators for men and women, and even having one side of the street have sidewalks for women, one for men. These didn't happen. But um, he was also the fellow, though, who, who advocated for having women allowed to go into soccer stadiums. They would be a good influence on rowdy men. Um, and then the, the supreme leader, uh, Khamenei, uh, forbade that. He said, no, 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 we're not going to do that, which is, I think, a really good example of the extent of the power of the president in Iran. They can't even let women into stadiums. It's the supreme leader who really is the one in charge. And that's something that people here often forget about. They assume the president is the, the main one. But when you're looking at politics, you always need to look at what uh, Khamenei is saying. Or, um, and he's, he's been the supreme leader since uh, Khomeini died. Then during the time of Ahmadinejad is when the Green, green Movement protests um, arose over elections that many people felt were um, fraudulently um, counted. They felt that um, uh, someone else should have won. Green was the color of the, that candidate, um, Musabi. So um, the, that Green Movement was very important and very brutally suppressed. There's a movie, The Green Wave, about that which is really interesting. It takes whatever bits of footage um, the filmmakers could find that individuals had taken at that time, mostly private citizens, and then weaves them together um, with drawings, a cartoon-like fashion um, to make the movie, which is a, a, a really powerful one. And interviews people, men and women, um, young men and women who are abroad, who are activists. Um, Hassan Rouhani was elected in 2013 as president. Uh, again, people felt this would give some scope for opening. Um, the relations with uh, countries outside, especially in the West, have not made it easy for him to open up when the country feels under siege, when the sanctions are constantly um, uh, made more and more severe. It's very hard to want to advocate for any open relations or even opening it with, within the home society. But he has been reelected. And 2018, of course, is the time when the US withdrew from the joint nuclear deal. Now, these categorizations of youth, some are frivolous, um, like the vegetable oil generation. Um, I heard this referred to in the 70s in Iran. It was really condescending, and people would make jokes about it. They were referring to the kind of weak and wimpy people um, who were the youth uh, compared to their elders who were the animal fat generation. It's sort of the real men don't eat quiche uh, kind of approach to things. But they, I would hear this tossed out. But I think much more importantly, the young people who grew up during the Iran-Iraq war developed a number of terms for referring to themselves. Now, Nasl Sevom, or the third generation, is a, a term that I've read about referred to a number of ways. Some people say it's the same as these young people who grew up during the war. Others say it's for those who came after the war. I, I've, I've had competing sources. I suspect that after the war may be the more accurate one because then the third generation makes sense because there's the, the children of the revolution, there are the children of the wartime, and then those who came after it who have extremely different experiences growing up. Um, then the, these people who grew up in the 60s, that's when the years become important. They're called the decade of the 60s or the, the kind of 60s uh, people because it was 1359 to 1367, a large chunk of the 60s in Iran, the 1360s, when these people were growing up. So they refer to themselves as the Dahiya Shastia. Now, they also sometimes are called the Khamushi or quiet generation or the Sukhte, burnt generation. They feel they lost their childhood. There were bombs falling. There was a lot of privation. There was a lot, you know, a lot of family members were going off and being killed. It was a really deeply tragic time. And these people um, get together, uh, refer to themselves as a group. It's different from millennials where that's kind of a media derived de definition. This is something that was generated from within. So I think those things, too, are really interesting to look at. How do youth define themselves? So um, just, just something to think about as you're looking at other areas. If you're 
interested in pursuing this, there's a really wonderful book, Prozac Diaries, Psychiatry and Generational Memory in Iran, written by Orchidea Behruzan. I'll have a, a list for you later of these, but um, she's a psychiatrist and has a PhD in social sciences from MIT. She was in a, what is it, a history of, um, history of science and technology program there. But it's a really wonderful book, but she's analyzing especially this group of these 60s people and how they relate to one another, especially through blogs. There's a lot of communication that way, um, a lot of remembering of the war. They feel they're the last generation that's really going to remember the war and they need to preserve these things that are very important to determining who they are and something that they feel is very important to Iran. Now, Iran is a, a large, has a very large population which is not growing at the same pace. It, it used to be about 83 million, largely urban. Um, as uh, Omar Boom mentioned with Morocco, it used to be much more rural and over time is becoming increasingly urban. A lot of um, people for jobs and, um, and education as well have moved into the cities. Um, the, for these youth groups, it's a very large percentage of the population. 15 to 24 was 27% in 2015. It's changed a little bit, but you know, not all that much. I was trying to find solid numbers. Um, median age is uh, just under 30. And the literacy rates now um, have gone for young people. Um, these are, again, in this 15 to 24 range are very high, over 98% for both young men and young women. Um, this was very far from the case um, some years back. Certainly under the Shah's government, it was not like that at all. There's been a very heavy emphasis on education in Iran. The unemployment rate, however, uh, though education is very much advocated, there's a very high unemployment rate for youth. It's just about doubled since 1990. And you know, the, the sanctions are, uh, of course, related to that. Um, industry is not doing well. The economy in general is, is really having a rough time. And this is something that's affecting young people very, very deeply. So you can see that then in 1990, after the war, there were more jobs for people um, who were seeking them than, than are now proportionally. Education is, is hugely important. And in many parts of the Middle East, Iran certainly among them, there's been just an explosion in the creation of private universities. Um, and so there are many more opportunities for people to um, be studying. Not all of these institutions are of the same quality, but they're available. They also have state universities established in rural areas and in um, more suburban areas. So there's a lot more access to education for people from all different segments of society. This is particularly important for young women whose families may be hesitant to let them go to cities where they feel it will be unsafe for them or where their reputations might be at stake. If there's a state-run um, university nearby them, they'll feel very comfortable sending their, their daughters to a place like that. So many more young women have been able to um, get educations. Now, women are at least half of those in students in higher education and a huge percentage in all fields other than engineering, 65% and over, um, especially in medicine and in other basic sciences. There isn't this um, sort of, I don't know, math phobia in Iran that you find in the United States that maybe girls shouldn't be studying these things. I was told that when I was in school. We were even given tests as to uh, when I was in middle school about you know, what kind of aptitudes you had and maybe certain people wouldn't want to go into these fields. It's just not appropriate for you. And it, it, it you know, did divide to some extent along gender lines. And if you happen to do well, they, it was almost as though something was wrong. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was really unfortunate. But um, you can see that by two, 2026, um, the Iran is projected to have more than half of those in this um, young age group of 15 to 24 having a bachelor's degree or higher. You know, education is just a, a really enormous impetus and it makes a, a big difference. Um, but unemployment is also an impetus to pursuing education. And for a lot of young women in particular, uh, going to school is something that gets them out of the house. They meet other people. It engages their minds. They're not bored. And if there aren't jobs, well, just go for a master's. And then maybe that master's will help you get a job. But in the meantime, you're not stuck at home. And there are lots of people who, who respond that way. It's really very important to them. Now, for young women, um, traditionally, 
you were a ch being, uh, you could be a child and then you were an adult. There were these very um, de clear binary between these two. And it's only in recent decades that you've had kind of teenagehood or a, a time, the waithood period that was written about in one of your articles, where you have an extended period of time when you're sort of in between those. And conventional markers of adult status, such as marriage, did define individuals. Um, an unmarried woman was, is always called a girl. She's doctor. If if you're married, you're Zan. So you could be 14 and married, you're a woman, but you could be 67 and unmarried, and you're a girl. And you, to some extent, are treated that way. The family doesn't feel that you have the same authority, the same experience. Um, you're kind of taken care of, looked down upon in some cases. I'm, I'm referring to some people that I've known who had found themselves in that case. But these were the um, more traditional ways of looking at it. It also makes it very difficult when you're translating for an article here in the United. United States, you're supposed to say of you know high school age girls, you would say young women, but you know that again is implying that they have had sexual encounters because it's uh, associated with marriage. So it's a real problem when you're writing. Do I use young women? Do I use girls? Do I use females? Which is more neutral but sounds very clinical. It, these are things when you read people's articles, you can kind of read what they're struggling with, or maybe things uh, to which they are oblivious, and and maybe they shouldn't be. <laughs> so, but it, it's an issue. Um, the Islamic Republic, of course, has a, a very strong emphasis on female modesty, segregation, and domestic roles for women. But at the very same time, they have that emphasis on education, wanting women to be well-educated, to be well-educated mothers, to bring what they know to the workforce, inappropriate um, kinds of employment. Initially, right after the revolution, there was a time when there was a very restricted definition of what was appropriate employment, so that even if a woman wanted to go to medical school, I have um, a niece who is in this situation who wanted to be a neurosurgeon, but she was not allowed to do so. She studied ophthalmology. She could have been a pediatrician. She could have been a gynecologist. But if you're a neurosurgeon, you're dealing with male bodies from the neck down. Not a good idea. That, this is no longer the case so much, but she was caught in that time period when that was not allowed. So um, you know, these, these ideas affect people in all sorts of ways. There's been a, a fair amount of opening up, but um, women, uh, you know, judges like Shirin Abadi, who the Peace Prize laureate, had been a judge in a court very important. She later, after the revolution, was made to be a secretary in her own court because women couldn't be judges. You can imagine how she felt about that. Her uh, memoir, Iran Awakening, talks about that to some extent. Now, I wanted to mention to you uh, a small case study about uh, uh, what was a village outside the city of Shiraz in southwestern Iran, Ali Abad. I'm mentioning this because there's an anthropologist named Mary Hagelin. Uh, she's written a very good book about a revolution, the Iranian um, the revolution that took place in the village. She happened to be there as an anthropologist and was going to study land reform. But then all the um, revolutionary activity was beginning to take place around her. And she said, you know, people don't want to talk about land reform. They're talking about politics. Maybe I should follow this. And so her book, Days of Revolution, is a, a really good one um, about that and talks about a a group, too, that people don't usually. Usually it's all very urban-centric studies of the Iranian revolution or it's in Tehran, but she's in a very different area. And she does talk about women's involvement um, at the village level. Now, she was there uh, doing research in 1978 and 1979 and was able to stay living in the village. Um, at the time that the revolution um, became an accomplished fact, there was a discussion in the village of whether she should be allowed to stay or not. She was with her husband and her young daughter. And um, she was able, through her personal contacts, to get a letter from a, a very well-respected local Ayatollah saying that um, she was OK, and he, he felt that it was appropriate for her to stay and complete her studies. And they nailed that to the mosque door so everybody could see it. And she was allowed to remain and complete her work. It wasn't always easy. Not everyone wanted to talk to her. You could imagine being an American anthropologist there at that particular very sensitive moment uh, was a little difficult. But um, she then has gone back a number of times from 2003, and she's been there more recently, two to six. Um, in a particular article, she talks about um, the changes for young women. But she has some, a very close friend who is a professor at the University of Tehran. And she tends to study things like, um, like care of the elderly in Iran uh, and re some religious topics, things that the government doesn't see as a problem. And she has gotten visas when almost nobody does, else does. So there is a lot of continuity in her work. 
this kind of longitudinal research is rare. So she's able to compare these time periods, which are, and found some things really striking. You know, when she was there in 78 and 79, and I visited her in the village because I was living in Shiraz, um, the, the women didn't have very many opportunities at all. Families didn't uh, encourage girls to go to school. It was elementary school, and then when they got um, to what was regarded as marriage age, um, that was pretty much it. If they had wanted to go to middle school or high school, um, or goodness, the university, they'd have to leave the town, and that was considered something inappropriate uh, for most families. Now, by the time she went back in this 2003 to 6 period, there were multiple kindergartens, state as well as private, and the private ones were run by some women. Um, there were elementary, there's elementary school, middle and high school, and as I mentioned before, this Islamization of the school system under the government made it something more palatable for a lot of families. They felt, okay, our daughters are going to be in a sex-segregated environment, they're going to be able to be educated, there's no risk to our reputations, and um, also education was gaining in status at the time. So it got to the point that now girls are expected to have completed um, high school. She said that also the way that life for young girls operated in the village had changed a lot in that they used to have to help with a lot of the domestic chores and gathering of food and preparation of food and weaving and taking care of animals and lots of very time consuming things. That's no longer the case. Um, for weddings, she even said people in this, uh, what is no longer really a village, has become part of the urban sprawl of the larger city of Shiraz, they cater. <laughs> you know, and, and people buy prepared foods from outside, and some women may prepare food for sale and make that a business, but other ones just are um, doing pretty well. One of the reasons is with that urban sprawl that's gone into the area where that village is, their land has become much more valuable, and so they've sold off some of it, and financially they're doing pretty well, and that's made a big change for them too. Um, most of these girls in the town now take university entrance exams. These are really grueling, the concours that happens annually. It's, it's terribly stressful for all the students. You um, rank all of the different fields in which you would like to study and the universities where you would like to study. And based on what your score is, you kind of get matched up um, if you succeed. And many people don't. But in that town, about 70% of them who succeed in the concours are, are girls. And Mary writes about the fact that the young men tend not to study as much as girls. When she asked the girls about it, they said, well, the boys are allowed to run around, play with their friends outside, do all this stuff. We can't. We're home. We might as well study. This is something we can do. At least we're not bored. And they end up doing way better than the young men. Also, the young men see themselves as having more employment opportunities, maybe in local private businesses, and they're not quite so concerned. They think to make a go of it, they may not need to go to university. For the girls, that may be the only game in town. And so um, the people often talk about the high rates of women's enrollment in universities in Iran, which is indeed the case. But this is, these are part of the reasons for it. And um, some of the families only want the girls to go to Shiraz if they're more conservative, if they, can, if they get into a university there. There always is this sort of subjunctive factor. Can you make it? Elsewhere in Fars province, um, they, it, it was interesting, at least to me, that they, she said that the one they absolutely don't want their girls to go to, with very few exceptions, is the University of Tehran, the big decadent city. You know, that's the place where they're going to get in the most trouble, potentially. So probably they wouldn't want that. There's also, they would much prefer, of course, they go to state institutions, which are very inexpensive as opposed to the private universities, which may be of, of lower quality, but they're, um, they're open to more people who haven't passed the concours, um, but they're, they're quite pricey often. And now, um, she said, even so, prestige was more related to spending on the, the wedding for the daughter and all the, the trappings of the dowry than the girl's education. So they're kind of in their, an in-between moment of valuing the one but still having the heritage of those other values. Now, marriage is then a real problem, you know, because that's something that if it, that's what confers adulthood, but if you get married, your chances to continue with your education may not be quite as great. And Mary cites a lot of um, situations where there are young women who say, I want to continue with my studies. I'm not going to marry. The parents exert a lot of pressure. Maybe there's a young man who really wants to marry them. And they all promise, oh, you'll be able to continue with your studies. And then it doesn't happen. 
And girls have seen this, and they know that this is a possibility, so they're careful. In the case of one young woman in my own family, I know that it was written into her marriage contract. Marriage contracts have these sort of open spaces where you can put in anything both sides agree to that are not counter to Islamic law. What they put in for her was that she would be able not only to go to medical school, where she was in doing her earlier studies then, and her husband was someone who was a little further along in his, but to be able to go on to a specialization, because that family had seen a lot of girls in medical school marry and then get caught at the GP level. They, you know, they didn't want to be general practitioners. They really wanted to become some kind of specialist. So that went in the marriage contract. But then you have to have a family that has the presence of mind to include that, and support it, and the husband's family would have to support that too. But it's an, an interesting opportunity. But once you have higher education, especially when the young men in the village may not at the same rate, whom do you marry? You know, who's out there? Does a, a girl with a university education want to marry someone who's not her equivalent? There's also um, the problem that parents would like you to stay closer to home, you know, for them for all sorts of reasons of affection and and utility and I mean it's all mixed and reputation it's all mixed up together. Um, so how do you meet potential husbands? Now campuses have more women than young men on them because more girls are getting accepted and studying these things. Also, it's sex segregated, and if you're seen talking to young men, I mean that doesn't go so well, and the the institutions tend to monitor these things fairly carefully. The, um, so even if you do meet someone, will the young men that you meet in Shiraz or potentially even, you know, heavens for Fen Tehran, would they be interested in a girl from the village? There's a high value on urbanity and people look down on Dahatis. I think it's mentioned in one of the articles and you're considered a, a hillbilly defined this way. So um, girls are very concerned not to present as somebody from the village. You, you dress differently, you act differently, you learn to speak differently, perhaps. Um, the other thing is that even with an education, the uh, opportunities for young women to work are, are not that great. And, and marriage continues to be what Mary described as the required ingredient in a, a female's life. Now, work is an interesting thing. 1978 or 9, there was very little work outside the home. People were making little um, crocheted slippers in the village and selling those, um, selling the, doing the piecework with the crocheted tops of them. Um, that kind of thing could be done, but very little else. And if there was a choice between domestic work and, and school, the domestic work would win out. In this later time period, she found that, uh, as I said, that there was a lot less that people had to do. Women themselves were becoming housewife consumers, and um, they're, the, but people still too have these worries about employed girls. You know, if you're getting out of the house and you're that independent, what's happening out there? Whom are you meeting? What are you doing if you meet them? So there's, uh, there are more opportunities a little bit to get out for education and to some extent work, but the values are, are ones that, that persist. Also, the women face a scarcity of jobs. Everyone in Iran faces this problem of unemployment, but for women it's worse because there are a lot of employers who would rather employ someone male. They also, um, at least in some cases I know of, figure, well, if you support a man, you're supporting a household and more people, and, and the woman has got somebody else to take care of her, which may often not be the case, but that's the, the way it's supposed to be. So they have a hard time getting jobs. Um, also, their unemployment rates, and Mary ran the numbers for different levels of education in the village and how many of the women were employed. The more educated they were, the less employed they were. And there was even a case of a young woman who had a university degree, came back, was working in a local institution, and she didn't like the, the male superior telling her what to do. She quit, and now she's sitting at home. And she thought, I have this education. I shouldn't be told what to do. And so it, it's a real double bind, and it's just probably going to get worse, both because the economy is, is doing not well and is likely to do worse, and because more women are getting degrees. So you, there's more pressure of people for the few jobs that exist. Now, the changes that exist then for young women are, um, you know, compared to their high levels of education, and Mary said she found this really troubling. She's known these families for years, so she's seen these kids grow up. She's known their parents and grandparents. But this, uh, their opportunities for employment outside the home are low. But she said they do get a lot of experience and confidence before marriage, and they tend then, because of the education, to marry much later than was the case when she was there around the time of the revolution. They have children later. They have fewer children. 
And the extended family she's found in many cases is being replaced by the nuclear family. The mother-in-law no longer holds sway in quite the same way, and a couple likes to live on its own. Now, this is a big change for a lot of women, including the mothers-in-law. Um, and the women also are involved in the town council. There are lots of rituals that are more women's rituals, and the women themselves now are running them. So this has become a job for some women to serve as officiants at them. Um, I've been to some of those rituals. Women do the chanting, the singing, bring their sound systems. Um, they're, they're really very enterprising. In national government in Iran, too, there are models for girls that girl, women can be can serve in parliament. Um, women are in high ministry posts in the national government as well as local government. Um, maybe not in huge numbers, but the women constantly contest these restrictions. Thus, in one of your articles, it mentions the word rajal, and there's a, a lot of discussion about what that means. Does this mean only men can run for president, or is it a person who's qualified in various ways? And every year, women uh, that there's a presidential election, there are quite a few women who present their credentials to run as president of Iran. And so they're not giving up, and they uh, every time the higher bodies in the government um, just say, no, you can't do that, but they don't give up. And eventually, you know, one can hope there would be a change. But at least in, in women's minds, they're qualified, they're ready, they um, really make a point of doing this. Um, young women do still continue to be monitored, um, but they do get outside. So you have this dual case of families still wanting to watch and control, but, but there are less opportunities for them to do it. Also think of the internet. Um, before, if you had just one telephone that was a, in the house um, but, and no computers or access to computers, families would know when their kids were on the phone and whom they were contacting, were they getting messages from somebody. But now it's just opened up a whole universe of communication that families really don't have a whole lot of control over. However, as Mary said, boys, it still seems, already have respect as their birthright. She said girls have to earn it, and one way to earn it is through education. <coughs> now, the challenges in the, the young women's lives are that as they have a little more leisure time, because the work at home is less onerous, and new expectations, they also are devoting more time to their appearance, just like those people in the Weighthood article who really um, feel they need to present themselves well, both for social reasons and also potentially for employment. Um, and they have to balance that these the resources they have for education, and then if they want to buy clothes or makeup or those kinds of things. Um, how are you managing all of that? You're supposed to be very modest, and yet you want to show yourself, like our discussion of how people dress. It's possible to dress modestly and well, but you know, balancing that could be an issue. Also, these women are off, young women are very assertive. Um, they'll tell people what they think and tell them off and have no hesitation about doing it. Iranian women are very forthright, and yet they're supposed to acquiesce in social situations um, uh, around the family. So you, you've got these contradictions built in all over the place. And I think that this contemplates research for social scientists as well, because it's so tempting to just look for agency. There's been such a, an emphasis on, on really letting people who think Middle Eastern women can't do much of anything or make any decisions, but they can't make all of them, and they have a really hard time. There's, they're up against a lot. So um, some people have written about that. Um, Erica Friedel, in an article that's on longitudinal dilemmas in ethnographic research, and I'll give you the references for these, talks about how in one article she wrote about women in power in Iran, talking about what, all the ways women exercise agency, she later thought better of it and said, wait a minute. If you look at what they're doing that we're calling agency, it's not something that benefits other women. It may not benefit them long term. We need to look for changes socially or something at a larger level that's really going to change the circumstances of, of women more generally. So she took herself to task in this article, um, which I, I think is a really good one. Um, then Susanna Olszewska, who wrote the article about classy kids in one of the um, articles that you have. They talk about her studies of young Afghan refugee women and how they're concerned with being bakelos, you know, being classy, having with being with class, as I guess is how you'd say it. But um, she talks about, Susanna Olszewska in that article, talks about the people who are Iranian, American, and foreign researchers who go to Iran and are so much focusing on these kinds of um, of people engaging in resistance that they don't see what's really going on. 
And she's very concerned with that. And so she's focusing on these Afghan refugee women and seeing the small ways in which they're trying to um, exercise some sort of independence and gain status, but they're really up against it. Being Afghan in Iran when you had no um, credentials, when you your kids weren't allowed to go to school because they didn't have um, national identity cards, that kind of thing. It's It was really, really tough. But I think that that, that article is something that is, is really a good one. Um, there are the one of the challenges. There are a number of challenges now. Um, in well, I'll mention the research ones later, I guess. But um, restrictions in public space continue. I mean, you have to be very careful about the way you dress, depending on the neighborhood where you are. Uh, I was in Iran in May, and I'm I'm used to being in more conservative areas in the city of Shiraz a long time ago. And so I tend to dress very conservatively. And then the way people were just scandalized me, I was really surprised. I, I hadn't been to these glossy malls and seen people with so much makeup and so little hijab and fancy clothes. And it was, was really, really different. But it, there, things are localized. And it's true that at different political moments, well, I think one of the ways that governments can most easily demonstrate their control is to have women dress the way they want them to in public. Anybody who doesn't even speak the language takes a picture of what's happening on a street in Tehran, you know if the government's really effective and in charge or not. And so at times when the government feels threatened, they clamp down on women's hijab. And you find that um, something that right now, I think it's maybe a, a more sort of in-between moment, or certain neighborhoods, or if you're around government buildings, or a certain um, places to which you want to have access, you're especially careful. If you go to for instance, I went to one shrine south of uh, Tehran where you can send um, messages to the 12th Imam, and they just have loner chadors there that you can put on. Interestingly, when my daughter and I came back from delivering a message to the 12th Imam, we went back to turn the chadors in, and we were in a canvas. Um, there were canvas uh, sort of things hanging, so you, when you walked in the room, nobody could see inside, and just women were working there. So I took off my chador and my scarf slipped, and the women said, get your scarf back on. And I said, but there are only women here. They pointed to a camera in the ceiling. He said, there's surveillance. I know. I thought, then what's the point of all the canvas? <laughs> but I guess it was just the guys walking by. But but it it was it was really interesting. But you know, it's something very subtle, and people know how to dress where, when. If they don't, um, that's at their peril. I think. Also, um, even soundscapes are monitored. So women may not sing unaccompanied before mixed audiences. Um, there's a wonderful movie called Back Vocal that interviews women who are wonderful singers but always are doing the backup singing. As long as it's several women together, it isn't one woman's voice getting out there, which could be kind of um, a, you know, affect gentlemen in an untoward way. But if it's all together, then, then it's OK. So it's, it's a really wonderful, wonderful film. One of the singers who's trying to make a go of it even has to um, act like a kid. And she has this little kitty kind of voice that she uses as a voice for, um, uh, for ads on TV. And that's one of her jobs. And she's a very talented singer, but this is what she ends up doing. Um, women continue to contest these restrictions um, with creativity and in public, like the white scarves that I mentioned, where they had the, the slogans on them and the police couldn't take them off. So, um, or they do things like the women you may have seen who are standing on up on platforms in Tehran, and they took the, off their scarves and hung them on a stick. And there were women, like statues, all around town doing this. And it, it really created a big to-do very recently in Iran. You can see photographs of these women, which are really very compelling. Um, challenges to research. So the question, too, is when you're getting information about Iran for, from journalists as well as social scientists, who's doing that research? Um, who has access to Iran? Who can get permits to be there? Jo some few journalists, sometimes they're only restricted to Tehran. Um, the government is also very um, suspicious of social sciences, especially anthropology. There are a couple of books full of essays about only this and why anthropology has been considered suspect. Sociology is considered a little bit um, more appropriate. And last year, last spring, in the American Anthropological Association newsletter, there were a series of articles about this, um, partly uh, as responses to one woman educated in the United States, got a PhD in anthropology <coughs> here, went to Iran, and got a job to teach, but was having all kinds of difficulty because of how anthropology is defined, what's considered appropriate. Um, they wanted her translating some foreign works, they, but they didn't want her doing research. And they said, research? 
you know, that's for students. You just send them out to do it. I mean, don't, you know, don't sort of dirty your hands with that kind of stuff. It was not expected where she wanted to get in there and do some really solid research. And a number of people, including Orchidea Behrouzan of Prozac Diaries, um, also wrote about their experience um, with this kind of thing in Iran. So that makes a difference. Getting a visa um, to go to Iran is, is hard. Uh, American researchers, by and large, except maybe the, one of the few exceptions is Mary Hagland, whom I mentioned. Most Americans will not be allowed to do research there. Um, there used to be a lot of people, um, Western anthropologists working there. We had a Japanese student of anthropology here who did research in Iran because of his Japanese passport. It was a little easier for him. We have Iranian American students who do some research there. Um, there are a couple of problems with that. For certain kinds of things, you need an uh, Office of Foreign Assets Control or OFAC permission from the US Department of the Treasury. It's knowledge transfer. And so this is a, a big deal. Uh, we have a speaker coming here later this fall who went to Iran, made a film, did research on chemical warfare, and the and the um, she's, she's a really fine anthropologist, young anthropologist, but she did not get OFAC permission when she came back. Her university spent thousands of dollars on legal fees sorting it all out for her. Um, university policies too. We had a ban on university faculty and students going to Iran to do research or even participate in conferences for a while. That's been lifted to some extent, but the technology transfer aspect for certain things, if you're working in, say, optical sciences, that may not be approved. And so these are, are things that really get in the way of, of interchanges. So as far as the future of social science research in Iran, there, there are a lot of, of young, um, of young Iranians and sort of hyphenated um, Iranians, people who have Iranian citizenship and maybe Canadian, American, French, German, um, you know, uh, from other places in the world. So things are ongoing, but it's never, never, never easy, especially because the government looks down on it. And they have been arresting some anthropologists. Um, recently, a French woman, Fariba Adelha, was arrested. She's um, there now. And then Homa Hudfar, whom I mentioned before, was arrested um, so a while ago, was in prison for about four months and then came out. Uh, but there, it's, it's something where you never quite know what will happen. Um, with Homa Hudfar, I just so I don't forget, she's written a book on women and sport in Muslim context, edited it, and it has a number of wonderful articles, and it's free. It's published by um, women living under Muslim laws, and you can find it and um, just get, I'll also have the link for it that I'll give you so that you'll have that one. But it's, it's really complicated. You know, so many good things are happening. Women in Iran drive, they vote, they serve in public office, they you know, are working in businesses, they're very enterprising. But then there are the other um, sort of cultural and official constraints within which they operate. And I think it's pretty remarkable what they're able to accomplish, but we need to be mindful of, of those constraints and, and the role of some women in also enforcing those, I think. So it's, it's something that's endlessly interesting and changes moment to moment um, depending on how the political winds are blowing. But I'll stop there. I'm ready to you know, discuss any and all of this, other things. It's always hard to, to narrow down. I mentioned the work of Mary Hagelin because you have two such good articles among those you're reading about um, young people in Iran. You have the Honar Bin Holiday article and um, the other one as well about weighthood. And those are focused on urban areas more. So I thought I'd give you a perspective from uh, another um, segment of the Iranian population. But thank you. Thank you.